Uh, I hope that you guys have had a great weekend, and I hope that you guys have had a great morning worshiping together. I know that I have been encouraged and just recharged being able to worship with you guys, and I hope that you all have as well. Uh, so I will say that I'm a little thrown off my game here because everyone's kind of in different spots. Normally I sit over here, so this morning we're over here. Todd's usually over here, but now he's over here. Um, so if I get mixed up, just let me know. Just stop me real quick. Um, if you are a visitor, know that we are thankful that you've decided to join us for this Topsy Turby morning. Um, that includes me filling in for our preacher, Elisha. My name is Charlie, and I'm our youth minister, and I'm so glad that you're here. I ask that you guys will give us a chance to talk with you after church, that we can get to know you. But I also encourage you to come back next week so that you can hear a message from our preacher, Elisha. With that being said, let's go to God in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us the privilege to worship you. Thank you for all of your rich blessings. We thank you for your love and for your mercy and for your grace. Lord, we ask that the songs that we've sung and the prayers that we have said, that they have been an acceptable offering to you and a beautiful melody to you. Lord, I ask that, that you speak the words that you want spoken through me. That it's not my words, but yours. And I ask that those that are listening to this, that you open their ears to hear the words that you want them to hear. So they can become more like your son, Jesus. And Lord, again, I thank you for all of the rich blessings. I thank you for this building that we have. For these people that we are able to worship with. For the ability to worship you freely without fear of persecution. Lord, we thank you for so many blessings. And most importantly, we thank you for Jesus, for him being born, for him living, for him dying, for him resurrecting, and ultimately ascending. Lord, and it's because of him that we are able to pray. Amen. So there's a man named Hernan Cortez. And if you guys know anything about Cortez, he was a Spanish conquistador. He was a Spanish explorer that conquered the Aztecs in what is now known as Mexico. And Cortez went from someone who wasn't known, wasn't very important in Spain, and became someone that went down in history. That he got a title, he got an importance because of what he did. But before he became the person that conquered the Aztecs, he had to get here. So he left Spain with his men, and with his boats, and he traveled across the Atlantic. And there was trials, and there was challenges, there was weather, and it was hard. And when Cortez and his men got here, he got all of them on the coastline, and he wanted to give some motivational speech, and he talked to them, and then he gave this command. He said, burn the ships. And sure enough, they set their ships on fire, and they burned up that Cortez wanted his men to know that the only way that they were getting back home was if they went forward, that there was no hope for retreat, no hope to go back, except by conquering the Aztecs. And I think that for a lot of us, we like our ships to be close by. We like to have this, this hand holding on to this, that if something goes wrong, we can go back here, that if it gets too hard, too scary, too whatever, we have this that we can just go back home in. But I think Christ calls us to burn the ships. That the only way for us to get home, and home not Spain, but heaven, is to go forward. So today we finish our series of We Agree. That at this point we have looked at 12 different ones. That we have looked at one word, one faith, one Lord, one spirit, one father, one baptism, and several more. But the past 12 weeks don't matter. Those things that we agree on have no worth if we do not live them out. That if we agree on them, if we talk about them, if we come here and say, yes, we're 100% in agreement on that, but if we leave here and nothing matters for our, the rest of our week, the things we agree on don't matter. So this morning, as we finish our We Agree series, we agree on one life. But what does that life look like? 
Turn with me to Romans chapter 6 and we can see what Paul says about this one life. In Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 1, Paul writes to the church at Rome and he says this, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who die to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? As we look at this one life, the first part is that we die with Jesus. I like what Paul says here in verse 1, that these Romans are asking the question, you know, if God is so amazing for how he's forgiven us, shouldn't we sin more so that he can forgive more and be more amazing? And Paul says, that's crazy. Why would you still have that? Why would you still do those things? And as Christians... That's the first part of what we need to do, that as we enter these waters of baptism, as we die to ourselves, anything that was in us, that is in us, that does not glorify God, that does not honor him, we get rid of. This means that maybe the movies that we watch or the TV shows that we see or the music that we listen to, that if these things do not glorify God, we probably need to watch some other things. Or maybe for us, it means that the friends that we have grown up with, the friends that we love, the friends that we have spent so much time with, that when we are around them, if we become unchrist like maybe it's time for us to find some new friends. Or maybe it means that if we have a job or a sport or something else, that keeps us from being Christians, that we say, you got to go. I think as Christians, sometimes we have the mindset of, how close can I get to sin? How close is too close where that becomes sin? And I think instead we need to have the mindset of Jesus that he has in Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, we see the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is talking, and in verse 29, Jesus says this, he says, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. That our mindset shouldn't be how close can we get to sin. Our mindset should be how close can we get to God and how far away can we get from sin that maybe it isn't just dabbling in it, but that we are as radical as Jesus, where we say, I'm going to cut this and this and this out. That we die with Jesus. But this new life doesn't just stop there. It's not just about getting rid of that stuff. Let's go to back to Romans 6. and Let's see the next part of this life. In Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 4, Paul continues, and he says, We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be reunited with him in a resurrection like his. I like the way that verse 4 puts it. It says that we have been buried with him, that we have died with Christ, that these things that don't glorify God, we have gotten rid of them. But then it continues and says that just as Christ was raised, we too might walk in the newness of life. So as a youth minister, I get to talk to teenagers. And one of the most amazing things that I get to do is talk to them about, about baptism. And while we are talking about baptism, I talk about the amazingness of what it is, that you get forgiveness of your sins, that you get this Holy Spirit, that you get to become co-heirs with your Christ, that you get to become a child of God, that you get so many amazing things. But I stop and I talk to them about the cost of baptism. 
that when you enter these waters and you are dying to yourself and rising to something new, the question is, what are you rising to? That if you get baptized, what you are saying is that God, you are in control. That I think at this moment is when Jesus says, I need you to burn the ships. That there is no going back. That there is no other option. That the only way forward is with me. And I think that sometimes this is a little bit harder. That sometimes this can look like wanting to have a nice bank account. Because when life gets tough and it gets stressful, I want to lean back on my bank account and know that I have three, six, 12 months of, of cushion. Or maybe this means that you want your family to be as close as possible so that when things go hectic, you guys can circle the wagons and it's going to be okay because you guys have each other. Or maybe this means that you like to be promoted and like to have a prestigious job where when things are hectic, you have the power to fix it. I think that these things that we look at have the ability to compete with God, that it's not God. We don't want you in control. We want our money in control. Or we want to be in control. Or we want our family to be in control. On Wednesdays, we've been going through a book with the teens, and we've been looking at the study of idolatry. And in this study, we've looked at the Ten Commandments. So turn me to Exodus 20, so we can look at these Ten Commandments and see what God says about who should be in control. Exodus chapter 20, starting in verse 1. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. That first commandment is a powerful one. And God says, it's me. But I think sometimes when we hear this, we start to think of priorities. And we say, you know what, I have God, number one, and then I have my spouse, two, and my kids, three, and my work, four, and my sports team, five, or whatever your priorities would be. If you had to make your top five, how would it look like? And I want you guys to think about that. Because when God says that you shall have no other gods before me, I think we lose a little bit of what he meant in the Hebrew. That it isn't just don't put anything above me. That this commandment is that you should have nothing in the presence of God. That your list shouldn't be God, spouse, kids. It should be God, spouse, kids. That God is on his own plane. That nothing competes with him. It's not a close second. It's not even a distant second. That it is miles and miles of separation. That God is the only one that is there. And I think that as we look at this being resurrected with him, part of it is asking God, what are things that are in our lives that are too close to you? And I think that's a prayer that we need to try to say every day. That if it's our families, if it's our work, if it's our sports, if it's our politics, if it's something else, then we need to make sure that we are keeping those things way behind God. So we resurrect with Jesus. But there's more. Because it's not just putting to death the old things. It's not just saying, Jesus, you are in control. But then we continue in Romans 6. And we see what Paul says next. In Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 6. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin, for the one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him, for the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. 
So you must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. That we just don't die with Jesus, we just don't resurrect with Jesus, but then we live with Jesus. It's not enough to say, Jesus, you are in control and then live a life that does not reflect that. Our teens um, are some people that I pray for often. And if you guys aren't praying for our teens and praying for one another, I encourage you to add our church, our teens, our kids, each other to your prayer list. But one of the things that I often pray for our teens, whether alone or in class, is I pray this prayer. I say, Jesus, help the world to see more of you and less of us. That I hope that as our teens, but not just our teens, that our kids, that me, that you, that all of us, that every day that we continue to live with Jesus, more and more people see less of us and more of him. So what this means, because I think it's important to look at the end there where it's in verse 13 of Romans 6, where it says, do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present your members to God as instruments for righteousness. That are we saying, God, every part of my being, my bank account, my house, my hands, my body, my time, everything that I have is for you to glorify your name. So as we talked about in the last one, that there's different gods that we have that sometimes battle God, that our family, that our bank accounts, these different things try to supersede God. So when it comes to our money, are we okay saying, God, use it? When it comes to places that we are uncomfortable and God says, you know what, I need you to song lead and you are terrified of song leader, and you feel like you are the worst song leader, are you okay to say, God, okay? With your money, are you okay to have a little bit less security? Are you okay to say, God, I don't need a huge bank account because my trust isn't in that, but it's in you? Because I'll be the first to admit that those two things are things that I struggle with. That when it comes to song leading, I say, God, is there anything else you can do? I become like Moses saying, God, find somebody else. And it's always a gut check when I have to say, but God, it's not about me. It's about you. And there's often times with my money where I'll be talking with Ryan and I'll say, man, if we just had a little bit more, I, I, I wouldn't worry. I'd be perfect and happy. And it's a gut check to realize that means that I'm not wanting God. That part of living with him is that every action, every moment, everything we do is leading to us serving and glorifying him. There's a quote that I want to leave you as we wrap up with. It's a quote that I heard many years ago, and ever since then I've tried to make it one of the themes for my life. And the quote is that dying is easy. Living is hard. And as I think about that, I think that if one day we lose the freedoms that we have here, that to be a Christian means that we potentially might die, would I say, I'm good with that? I hope I would. And I think most of you guys would say, yes. But I think that that is the easy one. That in a moment it's over and we said yes and we're locked in and we're good. But I think that the harder one is that every day we wake up and we say, God, I choose you today. That every moment, every minute, every action that we take, it is that again that a same question of God, do I love you? And are we answering yes to those? As we die with Jesus as we resurrect with Jesus, and as we live with Jesus, we make these things that we have agreed on matter because we are living it out. As we look at this idea of baptism, of becoming a new person, a new life, 
Baptism is amazing and powerful. It is the moment that we are saved and we experience God's power, but this baptism isn't the end. That baptism isn't the finish line, but instead it is the starting line. The starting line for what we are going to do with Jesus every day that follows. So, if you guys are sitting here, and you guys are sitting here as people that have not burned the boats, and you guys have been holding on to old sins, to things that you should have put to death, I want to let you know that we can help you. Not as people that are perfect, but as people that know what it's like to have to put things to death for Jesus. Or maybe you are sitting here and you realize that you have been letting everything else control your life and you think that you are ready to have Jesus be the one that controls your life. We have water back here and we can baptize you. Or maybe you are sitting here and you realize that you have been baptized but you have stopped at that baptism. That you have not been continuing to live for Jesus every single moment. We can help you to do that. We can plug you in. That whatever your need is, we want to help you. You guys can come forward. You can find me. You can find an elder. You can find any other church member here. And we want to help you. Not as people that are perfect, but as people that every day are trying to make the same decision that we want Jesus to control our actions, our life, our everything. So if there's anything that we can do, I ask that you guys come forward as we stand and sing this song.